The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams The podcast versions of the original Facebook Live readings during the coronavirus outbreak by Matthew Ogden, The Bearded Wit Please bear in mind that as Facebook Live recordings, these are rough and ready, there are mistakes, there are a few trip-ups here and there, and there is laughter from the reader as he goes through and follows the humour himself along with you, the listener. We hope you enjoy listening to these and share liberally. Part 34 Before we begin, I'd like to ask you to seriously consider becoming a patron of The Bearded Wit by going to patreon.com forward slash The Bearded Wit. You can support me from as little as $5 a month, which is essentially a cup of coffee, uh, and that will mean that I will be able to continue producing this material and other podcasts that I do, and it would mean the world to me to have you um, know that you're, you've are you got my back on this. Uh, I love producing this material for people, and it's been a huge pleasure for me to do this, uh, which basically started as a project for family and friends right back at the beginning beginning of March last year uh, when the COVID-19 um, uh, virus was really beginning to kick in. It was a way of basically connecting friends and family all over the world who were finding it a bit difficult as we all did and it's grown into something where I've got a lot of people listening all over the world. It would mean the world to me if you could take the time just to pop over to uh, patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit, sign up from as little as five dollars a month, as I say, uh, it's a cup of coffee. It would mean the world to me because the more of you guys, you fabulous people out there that do it, the more I'm able to do more of this stuff for you on an ongoing basis. No obligation, but if you can, I would be so deeply grateful. Also, if you could take a moment to pop over to Facebook and uh, give The Bearded Wit a like and follow, uh, and also go over to my new YouTube channel as well, um, just search for The Bearded Wit, uh, and subscribe. Uh, I'll be putting all of the live readings slightly edited um, and cleaned up a bit uh, onto that uh, over the coming weeks. Um, but yeah, join up, uh, get involved, like, share, follow, subscribe, do all the usual social media things. Okay, on with the reading. Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. There were so many people that uh, responded when I was saying, okay, do we carry on with, with this or do we uh, sort of move on to something else? Whilst we will definitely, uh, because lots of people have come up with lots of great ideas, we will move on to other stuff. Um, the uh, overwhelming uh, response was, let's wrap up hitchhikers uh, before we move on so that's what that's what we're going to do um, and to do that more obviously we're going to move on to the sixth book in the series but before we start on on, on all of that um, I'd just like to do my usual thing which is to uh, ask you lovely people uh, to consider supporting me by going to patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit and signing up to become a patron. Uh, there will be sort of extra bits of content uh, and a few behind the scenes kind of stuff uh, and some gated content that only you as a patron will be able to get uh, access to. Um, all of these readings I will continue to do uh, uh, as I do and all of the stuff that I put out onto the podcasts I will do but there will be extra stuff that you can get hold of by becoming a patron and you can do that from as little as five of your earth dollars uh, US dollars um, so please do consider doing that um, it does make doing this uh, even more uh, pleasurable knowing that I've got a bit of financial independence from doing it as well. So please do that. And on that subject, I do have to put out a huge thank you to one of my fans who happens to very conveniently live in Colling, uh, fabulous chap Ulf Tannorp. And he asked me, he said a while back he was going to make a contribution to my channel uh, if I promised to read a book. Um, and then we, we met uh, for a, a, a socially distanced quick beer the other day uh, in the middle of a hailstorm. It, it was it was it's spring in Denmark, which means it's like having trying to have a conversation with the pigeon. It's it's nothing makes any sense anyway. Uh, and he he asked me, he said, would I would I please read this book? 
and he would supply a copy of it. So so I am going to do it at some stage, but, but his main point, he, he basically said, look, I don't care whether you read the book or not. Um, I just wanted to make a contribution to the channel. And he made a very, very generous uh, contribution to the channel. And he left me a little note here, and I'll read it to you because uh, it's the biggest single contribution that I've had, other than my big brother. Uh, but I do, I do want to uh, sort of share the kindness that Ulf put there, saying, "Read out or not, this is to support your channel. Thank you for what you do and who you are, Ulf." Um, that sort of stuff hits me <laughs> right in the feels. Um, it's a it's a beautiful beautiful gesture um, from Ulf, and I really do thank you very much for that, uh, Ulf. I will at some point in the future, I promise, uh, get around to reading that. I might have to talk to people about rights before I do that, or do it as a very personal one for you and gated content or something. So, a few hellos, every uh, Karen. Yes, hello, Suzanne Morgana. Hello from Missouri, Suzanne uh, Maria Brett, uh, Niels Franz. Yes. I think I think that's that's everyone that said hello so far. But please do say hello. So yes, we are going to do, as I said, ish, um, the sixth book in the trilogy, <laughs> part six of three, uh, as it puts on the cover. Uh, and this is written by uh, Owen Colfer. Now I'm saying Owen because I think that's how it's pronounced because it's it's E I O N E O I N. Um, but it's sort of it's one of those names that is, is of, of Gallic uh, extraction, and and I think it comes out in the end as, as close to Owen as possible. Um, and he is the he is the author actually behind the very very good uh, series of books, the Artemis Fowl books. But he was he uh, also a long time collaborator with various in various sort of guises with Mag, uh, Dirk Mags and and others, uh, and and with Douglas Adams. Um, and we finished uh, the mostly harmless, and it is quite a bleak book. Um, uh, and Adams himself, after penning it, did say that he intended to wrap up his trilogy of six books with a sixth book, which was less bleak. Um, and then, unfortunately, very unfortunately, he was taken from us, uh, and there was no way of getting around to actually finishing. Uh, the the book uh, series as he had intended, um, and um, Jane Belson, um, uh, Douglas's widow, agreed with and sanctioned the penning of this book by Owen Colfer. So it is officially it is canon. Um, so whilst it's not penned by Douglas, it's definitely done with him in mind. It becomes kind of a sort of reverential uh, and. Uh, um, yeah, a reverential nod in Douglas's direction, but it also has Colfer's own uh, angle on it. Uh, some like it less than others, others really like it. Um, I have yet to form an opinion because I have not read it. So uh, I am going to be doing this as and I've done it as decided to do it as blind as possible. So bear with me if I stumble and, and screw up. Uh, but yeah, let's uh, let's see what um, and another thing has to offer for us uh, as a, as a conclusion, and we'll take it with the foreword as well. Um, but it's great to be back reading for you guys. I love doing this. Thank you very much for your encouragement. Thank you very much for your really positive comments. Uh, and and I've I've I, oh I've forgotten. I'm so sorry. I did write back in person, but I've had a couple of people write to me in the last week just to say thanks for all this. Um, thank you all uh, for those those messages. It 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 means a heck of a lot. It really does. So here we go. And another thing. Forward. We'll start with. Oh, of course I can't. I can't start without this, can I? I love tea. <laughs> Mm. Oh God, I really do. <laughs> Sorry, I am so massively, massively English. It's ludicrous. Oh God. Mm. All right, here we go. Forward to and another thing. Book six of three in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. If you own a copy of The Hitchhiker's Guide to, to the Galaxy, then one of the last things you will be likely to type into its V-board would be the very same title of that particular sub-ether volume as, presumably, since you have a copy, 
then you already know all about the most remarkable book ever to come out of the great publishing corporations of Ursa Minor. However, Presumption has been the runner-up in every major causes of intergalactic conflict poll for the last few millennia. First place, invariably going to land-grabbing bastards with big weapons, and third, usually being a toss-up between coveting another sentient being's significant other and misinterpretation of simple hand gestures. One man's, wow, this pasta is fantastico, is another's, your mama plays it fast and loose with sailors. Let us say, for example, that you are on an eight-hour layover in Port Brastra without enough credit for a gargle blaster on your implant, and if upon realising that you know almost nothing about this supposedly wonderful book you hold in your hands, you decide out of sheer brain-fogging boredom to type the words The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy into the search bar on The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, What results will this flippant tappery yield? It's a bit like if you type your own name into Google. Don't do it. Firstly, an animated icon appears in a flash of pixels and informs you that there are three results, which is as confusing as there are, obviously, five listed below, numbered in the usual order. Guide note. That is, if your understanding of the usual numerical order is from small to large and not from derivative to inspired as with Falfang and Slugs, who judge a number's worth by based on the artistry, artistic integrity of its shape. Falfang and supermarket receipts are beauteous ribbons, but their economy collapses at least once a week. Each of these five results is a lengthy article, accompanied by many hours of video and audio files, and some dramatic reconstructions featuring quite well-known actors. This is not the story of those articles. But if you scroll down past Article 5, ignoring the offers to remortgage your kidneys and lengthen your prom... (laughs) Porn Wrangler... Oh my god! Um, We'll try that again. But if you scroll down past Article 5, ignoring the offers to remortgage your kidneys and lengthen your Porn Wrangler, you will come to a line in a tiny font that reads, If you liked this, then you might also like to read... Have your icon rub itself along this link, and you will be led to a text-only appendix with absolutely no audio, and not so much as a frame of video shot by a student director who made the whole thing in his bedroom and paid his drama sock mates with sandwiches. This is the story of that appendix. Introduction. So far as we know, The Imperial Galactic Government decided over a bucket of jeweled crabs one day that a hyperspace expressway was needed in the unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy. This decision was rushed through channels ostensibly to preempt traffic congestion in the distant future but actually to provide employment for a few ministers' cousins who were forever mooching around Government Plaza. God, that sounds like the British government. Unfortunately, the Earth was in the path of this planned expressway, so the remorseless Vogons were dispatched in a constructor fleet to remove the offending planet with gentle use of thermonuclear weapons. Two survivors managed to hitch a ride on a Vogon ship. Arthur Dent, a young English employee of a regional radio station whose plans for the morning did not include having his home planet blasted to dust beneath his slippers. He had the human race held had the human race had held a referendum, it would have been quite likely that Arthur Dent would have been voted least suitable to carry the hopes of humankind into space. Arthur's university yearbook actually referred to him as most likely to end up living in a hole in the Scottish Highlands, with only the chip on his shoulder for company. Luckily, Arthur's Betelgeusean friend, Ford Prefect, a roving researcher for that illustrious interstellar travel almanac, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, was more of an optimist. Ford saw silver linings where Arthur saw only clouds, and so between them they made one prudent space traveller, unless their travels led them to the planet Junipella, where the clouds actually did have silver linings. Arthur would have doubtless steered the ship straight into the nearest cloud of gloom, 
and Ford would almost certainly have attempted to steal the silver, which would have resulted in the catastrophic combustion of the natural gas inside the lining. The explosion would have been pretty, but as a heroic ending it would lack a certain something, i.e. a hero in one piece. The only other earthling left alive was Trisha Macmillan, or Trillian, to use her cool, spacey name, a fiercely ambitious astrophysicist come fledgling reporter who had always believed that there was more to life than life on Earth. In spite of this conviction, Trillian had nevertheless been amazed when she was whisked off to the stars by Zaphod Beeblebrox, the maverick two-headed galactic president. What, what one can say of President Beeblebrox that has not already been printed on T-shirts and circulated throughout the galaxy free with every U-bid purpose. Zaphod says yes to Zaphod was probably the most famous T-shirt slogan, though not even his team of psychiatrists understood what it actually meant. Second favourite was probably Beeblebrox. Just be glad he's out there. It is a universal maxim that if someone goes to the trouble of printing something on a t-shirt, then it is almost definitely not a hundred percent untrue, which is to say that it is more likely fairly definitely not altogether false. Consequently, when Zaphod Beeblebrox arrived on a planet, people invariably said yes to whatever questions he asked, and when he left, they were glad he was out there. These less than traditional heroes were improbably drawn to get drawn to each other. <coughs> Pardon me. I'll try that sentence again. These less than traditional heroes were improbably drawn to each other and embarked on a series of adventures, which mostly involved gadding around through space and time, sitting on quantum sofas, chatting with gaseous computers, and generally failing to find meaning or fulfilment in any corner of the universe. Arthur Dent eventually returned to the hole in space where Earth used to be and discovered that the hole had been filled by an Earth-sized planet that looked and behaved remarkably like Earth. In fact, this planet was an Earth, but just not Arthur's. Not this Arthur's, at any rate, because his home planet was at the centre of a plural zone. The Arthur we are concerned with had found himself shuffled along the dimensional axis to an Earth that had never been destroyed by Vogons. This rather made our Arthur's day, and his usually pessimistic mood was further improved when he encountered Fenchurch, his soulmate. Luckily, this idyllic period was not cut short by bumping into any alternate universe Arthurs who may have been wandering around, possibly in Los Angeles, working for the BBC. Arthur and his true love travelled the stars together until Fenchurch vanished in mid-conversation during a hyperspace jump. Arthur searched the universe for her, paying his way by exchanging bodily fluids for first-class tickets. Eventually, he was stranded on the planet Lamuella, and made a life for himself there as a sandwich maker for a primitive tribe who believed that sandwiches were pretty hot stuff. His tranquillity was disturbed by the arrival of a couriered box from Ford Prefects, which contained The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy Mark II, in the form of a smarmy, pan-dimensional black bird. Trillian, who was now a successful newswoman, had a delivery of her, own, of her own for Arthur in the shape of Random Dent, the daughter conceived with the donated, piece, uh, the donated price of seat 2D on the Alpha Centauri Red Eye. Arthur reluctantly took on the role of parent, but was completely out of his depth with the truculent teenager. Random stole the guard Guide Mark II and set a course for Earth, where she believed she could finally feel at home. Arthur and Ford followed, to find Trillian already on the planet. Only then is the Mark II's objective revealed. The Vogons, irritated by the Earth's refusal to stay kaboomed, had engineered the bird to lure the escapees back to the planet 
before they destroy it in every dimension, thus fulfilling their original order. Arthur and Ford rushed at semi-breakneck speed to London's Club Beta, pausing only to purchase foie gras and blue suede shoes. Thanks to the old dimensional axis plural zone thing, they found Trillian and Trisha Macmillan coexisting in the same space-time, both being screamed at by a very emotional random. Confused? Arthur was, uh, but not for long. Once he'd noticed the green death rays pulsating through the lower atmosphere, all of the day's other niggling problems seemed to lose their niggliness. After all, confusion was not likely to slice him into a million seared pieces. The Vogon Prostetnik had done his job well. Not only had he lured Arthur, Ford and Trillian back to the planet Earth, but he'd also managed to trick a Grebulon captain into destroying the Earth for him, thus saving the crew several hundred Vogue hours paperwork with the munitions office. Arthur and his friends sit powerless in London's Club Beta, and can only watch as the ultimate war on Earth is waged unable to participate unless involuntary spasming and liquefaction of bone matter counts as participation. On this occasion, the weapons of destruction are death rays rather than Vogon torpedoes. But then, one planet-killing device is pretty much the same as another when you're on the receiving end. T. Great recap of <laughs> five books, basically. And maybe there are some people who've been listening in for the last sort of book and they're like, okay, that was what was happening. Okay. Anyway, chapter one. According to a Janice's assistance, assistant at the Maxi Megalon University, who often loiters outside lecture halls, the universe is 16 billion years old. This supposed truth is scoffed at by a clutch of Beetlejuicean beat poets who claim to have moleskin pads older than that. rat a tat tat 17 billion, they say, at the very least, according to their copy of the Wham Bam Big Bang Scrolls. A human teenage prodigy once called it at, uh, once called it at 14 billion, based on a complicated computation involving the density of moon rock and the distance between two pubescent females on an event horizon. One of the minor Asgardian gods did mumble that he'd read something somewhere about some sort of majorish cosmic event 18 billion years ago, but no one pays much attention to pronouncements on, from on high anymore not since the birth of the gods debacle, or Thorgate, as it has become known. However many billions it actually is, it is billions, and the old man on the beach looked as though he'd counted off at least one of those million millions on his fingers. His skin was ivory parchment, and viewed in profile he closely resembled a quavering uppercase S. The man remembered having a cat once, if memories could be trusted as anything more than neuron configurations across trillions of synapses. Memories could not be touched with one's fingers, could not be felt like the surf flowing over his gnarled toes could be felt. But then, what were physical feelings if not more than electrical messages from the brain? Why believe in them, either? Was there anything trustworthy in the universe that one could hug and hold on to in the midst of a butterfly storm, other than a Howaleusian wind staunch? Bloody butterflies, thought the man. Once they'd figured out the wing fluttering a continent away sorry, once they'd figured out the wing fluttering a continent away thing, millions of mischievous lepidoptera had banded together and turned malicious. Surely that couldn't be real, he thought. Butterfly storms? But then more neurons poured across even more synapses and whispered of improbability theories. If a thing was bound never to happen, then that thing would resolutely refuse not to happen as soon as possible. Butterfly storms. It was only a matter of time. The old man wrenched his focus from this phenomenon before some other catastrophe occurred to him and began its rough slouch to be born. Was there anything to trust? anything to take comfort from. 
The setting sun's lit crescents on the wavelets burnished the clouds, striped stripped the palm leaves sorry, striped the palm leaves silver, and set the china teapot on his veranda table twinkling. Ah, yes, thought the old man. Tea. At the centre of an uncertain and possibly illusory universe, there would always be tea. The old man traced two natural numbers in the sand with a walking stick fashioned from a discarded robot leg and watched as the waves washed them away. One moment there was forty-two, and the next there wasn't. Maybe the numbers were never there, and perhaps they didn't even matter. For some reason, this made the old man cackle as he leaned into the incline and plodded to his veranda. He settled, with much creaking of bone and wood, into a wicker chair that was totally sympathetic to the surroundings, calling to his android to bring some biscuits. The android bought brought rich tea. A good choice. Seconds later, the sudden appearance of a hovering metal bird caused a momentary lapse in dunking concentration, and the old man lost a large crescent of his biscuit to the tea. Oh, for heaven's sake, grumbled the man. Do you know how long I've been working on that technique? Dunking and sandwiches? What, are le what else are left to a person? The bird was unperturbed. An unperturbed bird, said the old man, softly enjoying the sound of it. He closed the bad eye that hadn't worked properly since he'd fallen out of a tree as a giddy boy and examined the creature. The bird hovered, its metallic feathers shimmering crimson in the sun's rays, its wings beating up tiny maelstroms. Battery it said in a voice that reminded the old man of an actor he'd once seen playing Othello at London's Globe Theatre. Amazing what you can get from a single word. Did you say battery? asked the man, just to confirm. It could possibly have been flattery or even hattery. His hearing was not what it used to be, especially on initial consonants. Battery! said the bird again, and suddenly reality cracked and fell to pieces like a shattered mirror. The beach disappeared. The waves froze, crackled and evaporated. The last thing to go was the rich tea. Bugger, muttered the old man as the final crumbs dissipated on his fingertips. And then he sat back on the cushion in the corner of a room of sky that suddenly surrounded him. Someone would be coming soon. He was sure of it. From the dim caverns of his old memories, the names Ford and Prefect emerged like grey bats to associate themselves with the impending disaster. Whenever the universe fell apart, Ford Prefect was never far behind. Him and that accursed book of his. What was it called? Oh, yes. Uh, the pitchforker's pride is a fallacy. Well, that, or something very close to it. The old man knew exactly what Ford Prefect would say. Look on the bright side, old mate. At least you're not lying down in front of a bulldozer, eh? At least we're not being flushed out of a Vogon airlock. A room of sky is not too shabby as it happens. It could be worse, a lot worse. It will be a lot worse, said the old man with gloom and gloomy certainty. Certainty. In his experience, things generally got worse, and then on the rare occasion when they actually seemed to get better, it was only as a dramatic prelude to a cataclysmic worsening. Oh, this room of sky seemed harmless enough, but what terrors lurked beyond its rippling walls? None that were not terrible. Of that, the old man was sure. He poked a finger into one of the wall's yielding surfaces and was reminded of tapioca pudding. 
which almost made the old man smile, until that he remembered that he had hated tapioca ever since a bullying head boy had filled his slippers with the stuff back at Eaton House Prep. Blisters Smythe, you sneaky shit, he whispered. His fingertip left a momentary hole in the clouds, and through it the old man caught a glimpse of a double-height sash window beyond, and outside the window, could that be a death ray? The old man rather feared that it was. All this time, he thought, all this time, and nothing has happened. Ford Prefect was living the dream, providing the dream included residence in one of Han Wavell's ultra-luxury five supergiant-rated, naturally eroded hedonistic resorts, filling one's waking hours with permanent damage accounts of exotic cocktails and liaisons with exotic females of various species. And the best bit, the expense of this whole self-indulgent and possibly life-shortening package would be taken care of by his Dino Charge card, which had no credit limit thanks to a little creative computer tinkering on his last visit to the Hitchhiker's Guide offices. If a younger Ford Prefect had been handed a blank page and asked, in his own time, to write a short paragraph detailing his dearest wishes for his own future, the only word he might have amended in the above um, was the adverb Possibly. Probably. The resorts of Han Wavell were so obscenely luxurious that it was said that a Brequindon male would sell his mother for a night in the Sandcastle Hotel's infamous vibro suite. This was not as shocking as it sounds, as parents are accepted currency on Brequinda, and a nicely moisturised septuagenarian with a good set of teeth can be traded for a mid-range family motor carriage. Ford would perhaps not have sold either parent to finance his sojourn at the Sandcastle, but there was a bicranial cousin who was often more troubled than he was worth. Every night, Ford rode the fleshivator to his penthouse, croaked at the door to grant himself entry, then made time to look at himself in the bloodshot eyes before, facing, before passing out face down in the basin. This... Is the last night, he swore nightly. Surely my body will revolt and collapse in on itself. What would his obituary say in the Hitchhiker's Guide, Ford wondered. It would be brief, that was for sure. A couple of words, perhaps the same two words he had used to describe Earth all those years ago. Mostly harmless. Earth. Hadn't something rather sad happened on earth that he should be thinking about. Why were there some things that he could remember and others that were just about as clear as a hazy morning on the permanently fog-bound misty plains of Nephologia? It was generally at about this maudlin stage that the third gargle, blast, gargle blaster squeezed the last drop of consciousness from Ford's overjuiced brain and he would giggle twice, squawk like a rodeo chicken, and execute a near-perfect forward tumble into the nearest bathroom receptacle. And yet, every morning, when he lifted his head from the ensuite basin, if he was lucky, Ford found himself miraculously revitalised. No hangover, no dragon breath, not even a burst blood vessel in either, in either, scler either sclera to bear witness to the previous night's excesses. You are a fruity dude, Ford Prefect, he invariably told himself. Yes, you are. There is something fishy going on here, his rarely heard from, sorry, his rarely heard from subconscious insisted. His rarely heard from subconscious insisted. Fishy? So long and thanks for all the... Wasn't there something about dolphins? Not fish, true, but they inhabited the same... Habitat. Think, you idiot, think. You should be dead a hundred times over. You have consumed enough cocktails to pickle not only yourself, but several alternate versions of yourself. How are you still alive? Alive and fruity, 
Fraud would say, often winking at himself in the mirror, marvelling at how lustrous his red hair had become, how pronounced his cheekbones. And he seemed to be growing a chin, an actual chiselled chin. This place is doing me good, he told his reflection. All the photo-leech wraps and the irradiated co... Jesus H. Christ, excuse me. <laughs> All the photo leech wraps and the irrated, irradiated colonoleming treatments are really boosting my system. I think I owe it to Ford Prefect to stay another while. And so he did. On the last day, Ford charged an underwater massage to his credit card. The masseur was a Damagranian pom-pom squid with eleven tentacles and a thousand suckers, which pummeled Ford's back and cleaned out his paws with a series of whiplash tapotament 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 moves. Yes, that's good. That's what we'll go with. Pom-pom squids were generally hugely overqualified for their work in the spa industry, but were tempted away from their umpteenth doctorates by the lure of high salaries, plankton-rich pools and the chance of massaging a talent scout from the music industry and maybe getting themselves a record deal. "'Have you done any uh, talent scouting, friend?' asked the squid, though he didn't sound hopeful. "'Nope,' replied Ford, bubbles streaming from his plexiglass helmet, face shining orange in the pleasant glow of rock phosphorescence. "'Though I once owned a pair of blue suede shoes, which should count for something.' I still own one. The other is closer to mauve, due to it being a copy. The squid nipped at passing plankton as he spoke, which made conversation a little disjointed. I don't know if... If what? I hadn't finished. It's just that you stopped speaking. Yeah, there was a glint. I thought it was lunch. You eat glints? No, not actual glints. Good, because glints are baby gloons, and they're poisonous. I, I know. I, I was merely saying... More glints? Precisely. Uh, you sure you're not a talent scout, then, or, or an agent? Nope. Oh, for sark's sake, swore the squid, a little unprofessionally. Two years I've worked here. Talent scouts and agents coming out of your suckers, they promised. Not one, not bloody one. I was studying advanced kazoo, you know. Ford couldn't resist a lead-in like that. Advanced kazoo? How advanced can kazoo studies be? The squid was wounded. Pretty advanced when you can play a thousand of them at the same time. I was in a quartet. Can you imagine? Ford gave it a go. He closed his eyes, enjoined the, enjoyed the whop-pop of the suckers on his back, and imagined four thousand kazoos playing in perfect subaquatic harmony. Sometime later, the squid enveloped Ford in a half-dozen tentacles and gently flipped him over. Ford opened one eye to read the squid's badge. I am Bazoo, read the tag. Use me as you will. And underneath... In smaller print, I am allergic to rubber. So, Barzu, what kind of stuff do you play? The masseur got his tentacles a-pumping before he answered, whipping up a flurry of currents. Old songs, mostly. Covers. Uh, you ever hear of Hot Black Desiato? I have heard that name, Ford realised, but couldn't quite pin the memory down. Every day things got a little fuzzier. Hot Black Desiato. Wasn't he dead for a while? Barzu cocked his head, thinking about this. The squid's beak hung open, ignoring the tiny streaks of plankton flashing by. Hey, if you can't remember, don't worry about it. I'm having a few memory problems myself in this place. Little things like how long I've been here, what my purpose in life is, which feet to put my shoes on, stuff like that. The squid did not respond, and its ten tentacles rested heavily on Ford's torso like old rope. Ford hoped that Barzu had not suddenly died, and if the squid had passed on to the energy stage, would would their suck would the suckers lose their suck, 
or go into some kind of death-suck mode. Ford had no desire to spend the rest of his holiday having tentacles surgically removed from his torso. Then Bazoo blinked. Hey, buddy, sighed Ford, bubbles spiralling from his helmet. Welcome back. For a second there, I, I thought... Battery, said the squid, beak clicking to the T's, battery. I never noticed before, thought Ford, but that squid looks a lot like a bird. Then the underwater massage cave dissolved, and Ford Prefect found himself deposited in a room composed of blue sky. A familiar figure sat on the opposite corner. Ah, said Ford, remembering. Guide note. Remembering is generally a two-stage process involving dialogue between the conscious and subconscious parts of the brain. The subconscious opens proceedings by throwing up the relevant memory, an act which releases a spurt of self-congratulatory self endorphins. Well done, matey, says the consciousness. That memory is really useful right now, and I couldn't remember where I'd put it. You and me, pal, says the subconscious, delighted to have its contribution acknowledged for once. We're in this together. Then the conscious reviews the memory in its in-tray and sends a message down to the sphincter, telling it to prepare for the worst. Why did you remind me of this? It rails against the subconscious. This is awful, terrible. I didn't want to remember this. Why the zark do you think I shoved it into the back of my brain? That's the last time I helped you out mutters the subconscious, and retreats to the darker sections of itself where nasty thoughts are housed. I don't need you, it tells itself. I can make myself another personality out of these things you've discarded. And so the seeds of schizophrenia are sown with the kernels of childhood bullying, neglect, low self-esteem and prejudice. Luckily, Betelgeusians don't have much of a subconscious. So that's all right then. Ah, said Ford again, followed quickly by crap. He stepped gingerly across the floor of sky, noticing with a jolt of surprise that one of his legs flickered slightly for a moment. I'm not real, he realised, which was enough to stick a pin in his permanently buoyant mood. But he recovered quickly, something which the room's other occupant didn't seem to have managed just yet. Look on the bright side, old mate he called to the Earthman. At least you're not lying down in front of a bulldozer, eh? At least we're not being flushed out of a Vogon airlock. Remember that. A room of sky isn't too shabby as it happens. It could be worse. A lot worse. And it shortly will be, if I'm right about what's going on here, thought Ford. But he didn't voice this opinion. Arthur looked as though he had had quite enough bad news for one day. Interplanetary news reporter Trillian Astra spent a few anxious moments in the press bathroom before heading into the auditorium for possibly the biggest interview of her life. In the course of a celebrated career, Trillian had spent a year undercover in prosthetics working as a Vogon clerk in the Megabrantis cluster. She'd lost her left foot to frostbite when mine raiders on Orion Beta had ram-raided a mandronite's shaft, and more recently she had been attacked by a holistic orthodontist when she had the temerity to question the effectiveness of tooth-straightening chants. The galaxy knew Trillian's name. At the height of her career, she was feared by shady politicians, movie moguls, and pregnant single celebrities from Alpha Centauri to Vilt Vodel VI. But on this day, she felt the spectre of fear at her own shoulder. Galactic President Random Dent, her daughter, simulcast from the University of Maxim Egelon live to an audience of 500 billion. She was nervous. No, more than that, she was terrified. Trillian had not seen her daughter since... My God, she realised. I cannot remember precisely the last time I saw Random. Trillian tried to calm herself with ritual. 
You're looking good for an old bird, she said to the mirror. Do you really think this, darling? said the mirror, obviously highly offended by what paraded before its senses. If this is good, then you're having the low standards. Trillian bristled. How dare you? If you had seen what I have seen, if you'd been through what I've been through, then I think you might agree that I look pretty damn good. The mirror's sighs rippled the eight gel speeches. Uh, eight gel speech. There. Yeah. Try that again. The mirror's sighs rippled the eight gel speech. Oh, I can't do that. <laughs> One more time. The mirror's sighs rippled the eight gel speakers mounted in its frame. Enough with the history lesson, darling. I don't factor in the past. I just comment on the present. And right now, let me tell you, you look like eccentric Columbits on her third cycle. Believe me, honey, by that old whore's third cycle, things were most liquid and gas. If I were you, I'd buy myself a good towel, a bathrobe, and just... Trillian reached across and pounded her fist against the mirror's mute button. When did they start giving mirrors character traits? She could remember when only top-end androids and the occasional very special door had the serious cybernetic corporation's genuine people personality feature. Maybe Trillian didn't want to hear what the mirror had to say, but she could admit to herself that it was right. She did look old. Ancient, in fact. That's because I am zarking ancient, a hundred and five earth years old, what's left of me. Over the years, Trisha Macmillan had been chipped away by her job as a sup ether reporter, and soon only Trillian would remain. This was not simply a metaphorical statement. Trillian Astra had always been prepared to sacrifice everything for the network, her friends, her family, various body parts. She lost the foot on Orion Beta during the mining hostilities. 70% of her epidermis was seared off by plasma splash on the front line at the Carfrax Gamma Caves. Left hand and forearm were mangled by a desert crawler tread during the Daudalus Wars, and her right eye poked out by a flag on a little pointy stick during the Wango Pango Teeny Bop Ice Capade on Gagrakaka. So, what was left of Trisha Macmillan was an original brain, with added new fluid. One rebuffed eye, a couple of cheeks, one buttock, one facial, an assortment of minor bones and two and a half litres of human blood. The other three litres were not technically blood at all, but tears harvested from a hive of silver-tongued devils, small mammals indigenous to the Hastramill system. They are relentlessly exploited because of the usefulness of the absolutely every part of their beings, from their hinged silver tongues to their very thought waves, which can be harnessed to an aerial and used to boost video signal reception if you live down a hole. The same philosophers who cite the Babelfish as proof that God doesn't exist also cite the unfortunately initialed STD as proof that Satan does, an argument which even a potato with a charge running through it can see undermines their initial point. But what do they care? Head doctors love controversy. Ironically, Trillian was in Hastramill to cover a rally to protect the STDs when she was run over by a single, single, silver tongue float, constructed even more ironically from silver tongue hides, which irony she then trumped by receiving with a silver tongue transfusion whilst wearing to a protect the silver tongue t-shirt. It was later reported by Trillian herself that all this localised irony overload had caused the death of 11 empaths at the, attending the rally. 12, if the empath known to be already depressed, was added to the statistic. Trillian smooshed the plaskin on her cheek. It was smooth, but a little overstretched. The guy at the checkout had promised that her face would loosen out with wear, but it never had. On bad days, Trillian thought her face looked like a skull pushed into a balloon. A network executive had once described her as a slim, darkish humanoid with long waves of black hair, an odd little knob of a nose and ridiculously brown eyes. Not any more. Today was one of those bad days. Random. After all these years... 
Every time she looked into her daughter's eyes, it was like staring into pools of her own guilt. Trillian slapped her palm against the mirror. Ow! Hey! said the mirror, overriding the mute. Trillian ignored it. She needed to pull herself together. She had at one time been the galaxy's most respected reporter, and that was an achievement. She would force her regret into its box, down in the pit of her stomach, and go do her job. Trillian plucked at a strand in her helmet of quaffed sim hair, squared her shoulders, and walked into the auditorium to interview the daughter that had been conceived in a low-grav fertility satellite clinic near Barnard's Star. Trillian shuddered, as if morning sickness had not been bad enough without low-grav thrown into the mix. Random had every right to feel displaced. Her father was a test tube, her home planet, in so far as she had one, had been destroyed in several dimensions, and her mother had taken one long look at her and decided vis vigorously to pursue a career that would take her as far from home for long periods. No wonder Random was a little frosty. President Random Dent sat cross-legged in a hovering egg chair on stage, chanting quietly. By scubbard, by cuspid lie behind canine, behind lateral incisor, behind central incisor, tooth, find your place. The curtain had not yet been drawn, but she could hear the hubbub of the crowd through the heavy material. The curtain was velvet, not holographic, an expense grudgingly, grudgingly borne by the university at Random's insistence. While in no way anti-progress, the President believed that there was still room for tradition in the galaxy. She smiled softly as her mother was led onto the platform. From a distance, a person could be forgiven for thinking that their roles were reversed and that Trillian was the President's daughter, but up close the truth was plain. Surgery shine was written all over Trillian's face. The reporter's step faltered as she caught sight of her daughter, but she recovered herself quickly. "'You look well, Madam President,' she said in that typical reporter's accent, which was somewhere between Sector ZZ9 and Asgard. "'As do you, Mother,' responded Random. Trillian settled into a second egg chair and consulted her notes. "'President Random Frequent Flyer Dent,' Still using too many names? Random smiled in the calm manner of one who has been tantrum-free for decades. And you, Trillian Astra, still using the wrong one? Trillian smiled tightly. This was not going to be an easy interview. Why now, Random? We haven't seen each other for more than a dozen times in the past twenty years. Why now, when my career is on the wane? I go from beauty pageants on New Beetle to the biggest interview of my life. Random smiled again, a gentle creasing of her outdoorsy face. Her grey-streaked hair was stiff with sunshine and salt water. I know it's been a while, Mother. Too long. She stroked a small ball of fur around her neck and it mewled softly. Trillian saw tiny teeth and a tail, and her heart sank. I've heard about that thing. Your constant companion. It's some kind of little gerbil, isn't it? Cute. More than a cute gerbil, mother. Fertile is my companion. A flaboos, fully grown a font of knowledge, all transmitted telepathically. And then she dropped the bomb, the career killer. We were married yesterday. Trillian's skin felt tighter than it had a minute ago. You were married? It's a mental bond, obviously, though Fertile does like me to tickle his tummy. Keep it together, Trillian told herself. You are a professional. Let me let me get this straight. You communicate telepathically with Fertile. Of course. Communication is what keeps families together, haven't you heard? At this point, Trillian stopped being a reporter and started being a mother. 
Less of the payback jibes, young lady. This is your life we're talking about. You are Random Dent, the president of the galaxy. You united the tribes of Earth. You oversaw the official first contact ceremony. Trillian was on her feet now. You spearheaded the economic drive into space. You negotiated for equal rights for aliens. And now I want something for myself. Trillian strangled an imaginary fertile six inches in front of the real one. Not a gerbil, though, not a zarking gerbil. How is a gerbil going to give me grandchildren? We don't want kids, said Random blithely. We want to travel. What, what are you talking about? It's a rodent. He, said Random pointedly, is a flayboos. As well you know, and I thought you, of all people, would understand our relationship. The formidable Trillian Astra, champion of all people except her daughter. Trillian thought she detected a chink of light in the gloom. Wait, what? This is all about me? You are going to destroy your life to get back at me? That's one hell of a twisted revenge cocktail, Random. Random tickled her husband until he snickered. Don't be ridiculous, mother. I wanted you to be here uh, so I could introduce your... I wanted, uh, I wanted you here to introduce your son-in-law to the galaxy. It will be your crowning moment as a journalist and it will bring us together as a family. Trillian saw it all then. The genius of Random's coup de grace. If she announced this union in full 3D spectrovision, then she'd be a laughing stock. If she did not, then her daughter was lost to her forever, and would probably milk the situation for enough sympathy to win another term in office. At the very least, the Flayboos would vote for her. And there were zillions of those. Trillian's frame jerked spasmodically. Married! Forget it, Random. You're not using me to put a spin on your relationship. As soon as I get out of here, I'm going to track down your father and he can deal with you. Random shook with laughter, frightening her husband. Arthur? <laughs> Do you have any idea how far he would go to avoid confrontation? She paused, cocking her head to one side. Fertile says, and I agree that you have to announce this, Mother. The galaxy is expecting big news. Absolutely not. I refuse to be manipulated. You'd rather be controlled by the network like the robot you are. I can hear you buzzing from here. I can smell your circuits. Is there any part of you that's real? Can you put me in touch with my human mother? Or perhaps you know where her backbone is buried? Trillian was almost relieved that the facade of civility was scorched away. Screw you, random. The president nodded. Yes, Fertile, this is how she is. Are you surprised now that I'm difficult to read at all the defences I have erected around my brain? Trillian was almost shrieking. You are talking to a bloody yo-yo! Fertile seemed to react to this. Guide note. Though flayboos have no ears, they are extremely sensitive to vibration and can actually explode in extreme circumstances. Thor, the Asgardian and sometime rock god, held the record for spontaneous Flayboos detonation when he debuted his new tune, Let's Get Hammered, from a chariot in orbit around Scorn Shellus Delta. The record had previously been held by intergalactic rock band Disaster Area, who dropped a speaker bomb into a volcano crater where the Flayboos were enjoying a static electricity festival. Fertile's fur bristled and he opened a tiny mouth that now seemed to have a beak. Battery, said Fertile in a voice of wire and claws. What? said Trillian. Did I, did I just hear a flayboo speak? Now that would be news. Battery, said Fertile again, this time with some urgency. 
The velvet curtain rose slowly, but there was no audience behind it, just an auditorium of sky and two humanoid figures. Random and Trillian stood and gaped, family resemblance clear for once, in spite of the various surgeries and implants. "'What's happening?' said the President, her voice higher suddenly. "'Mother, what's happening? Where are my journalists?' "'Don't panic,' said Trillian, trying to keep the quaver from her voice. "'Something is happening here.' "'Something is happening?' shrilled random that's it after all your years in the field all you can come up with is something is happening this is a kidnap attempt that's what this is we've been transported somewhere trillian squinted at the humanoid figures who seemed to be growing increasingly familiar as though scales of forgetfulness were falling from her eyes kidnapped i don't think so not by these two they're harmless mostly. Random adopted her favourite presidential power position, feet planted, arms crossed. You two men, what have you done? I demand to know where we are. The shorter man noticed the new arrivals. It was pretty likely that he was one of them. Sorry, it was pretty likely that he would, as one of them was shouting at him. I think the question should be when we are, and possibly who put us here, followed by, is there a drinks trolley? Random scowled. Is there a drinks trolley indeed? Be flippant all you like, young man. I know that underneath you're as scared as we are. The young man smiled. I'm Beetlejuicean, Random. We don't do underneath. Random lost the urge to riposte when the sudden recognition of the second man hit her like a surprisoplasm pie in the face. Fa father? Daddy? Dad? Pick one, suggested the Beetlejuicean. It will make conversations easier. Trillian took off across the room of sky, moving faster than she had in years. Now, let's see what your father has to say about this marriage. Suddenly, Random seemed a lot younger. Daddy, she howled. Daddy, my stupid mother hates my husband. The father figure dropped his head and wished for tea. And that's where we will leave it for this evening. Quite appropriate, because that's the end of chapter one. Super! I hope the mistakes weren't too much of a distraction for you all, everybody. Um, I'm just going to finish my now cold tea. Thank you, as always, for your company. Um, we will continue, uh, same time, same place, next week. Um, <clears throat> as I say, please do, if you can... Uh, go over to patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit and sign up to become a patron if you haven't done already. It's about time! <laughs> but if you could, I'd really appreciate it. That does, uh, it really does help a lot. And um, yeah, it's great to be back. Um, it's going to be interesting to see where this goes. I, uh, what I'm actually particularly liking about this is. Uh, unlike some of you who may well have read this, if this is your first time ever hearing uh, the book, uh, I am hearing it for the first time myself too, which is kind of groovy. So, thank you, Morgana. Thank you for joining again. See you next week. Have a great week, everybody. Look after yourselves. Be fruity. Be hoopy. Uh, and, yeah, I will see you next Sunday. See you guys. <laughs>